Good morning, my name is Gaylene, and the Old Testament reading is found in 1 Samuel 20, verses 12 to 17. Then Jonathan said to David, I pledge by the Lord God of Israel that I will question my father by this time tomorrow or on the third day. And if he seems favorable towards David, I will definitely send word and make sure you know. But if my father intends to harm you, then may the Lord deal harshly with me, Jonathan. And worse still, if I don't tell you right away so that you can escape safely. May the Lord be with you as he was once with my father. If I remain alive, be loyal to me. But if I die, don't ever stop being loyal to my household. Once the Lord has eliminated all of David's enemies from the earth, if Jonathan's name is also eliminated, then the Lord will seek retribution from David. So Jonathan again made a pledge to David because he loved David as much as himself. The word of the Lord. Hi, my name is Nicole. The New Testament reading is found in 2 Corinthians 8, 7 through 9. Be the best in this work of grace, and in the same way that you are the best in everything, such as faith, speech, knowledge, total commitment, and the love we inspired in you. I'm not giving you an order, but by mentioning the commitment of others, I'm trying to pr prove the authenticity of your love also. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, so that you could become rich through his poverty. The word of the Lord. Hi, my name is Tom. Thank you for standing for the gospel reading, which is found in John 15, verses 12 through 13. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. The gospel of the Lord. Let's remain standing as we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your word to us. We pray that as we listen to your scriptures being read and being taught this morning, that you would be the one through your Holy Spirit that's speaking to us. We pray that your spirit would open up our eyes and our ears and our minds and our hearts to see and to hear and to understand and to believe all that you're saying and doing in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated. Good morning, survivors of the bomb cyclone 2019. Woo! I saw your pictures on Facebook. Some of you, Colin, you know, maybe among others, were stranded for a couple nights in different places. How many of you were stranded somewhere? Like, not in your house. Okay, just, okay, maybe Josh over here, yeah. Well, it was, uh, it's gonna make for a good story. You're safe, thankfully, you're all here. Uh, what, what a memory. I, um, m my wife, you, you may, some of you may know this, but before we had kids, my wife finished her master's in counseling and she was working at the church at the time and never uh, practiced like a private practice as a counselor, but there's a benefit that comes from being married to someone who's trained as a counselor. So we sometimes joke that she did all that training really just to live with me. Uh, but there's, there's also a drawback to it, and that is that when you uh, go on a vacation, just the two of you, and you talk about books, she's always trying to get me to read some sort of marriage counseling book, you know? And uh, so a few years ago, we were on a trip, just the two of us without the kids, and she's like, let's read this book together, and, and uh, it's called How We Love, and it's a great book, and it really it was a, a wonderful um, book about attachment theory and all of that, and, and, but I will say, it, it does change the way your vacation goes, because you have different kinds of conversations, uh, but, I, but I, learned, I learned through the process of reading this. Uh, a lot about attachment theory. And it's an interesting thing. I, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a counselor. But one of the things we learn from, from that field is that our earliest relationships of intimacy have a way of imprinting us for other relationships of intimacy. 
And so the way that we connect with parents or don't connect with parent, our parents tends to affect the way that we approach others whenever there's a next close relationship or another close relationship. Sometimes siblings have a part of that, and that affects the way that you get along with friends and roommates. And so if you've ever been in that situation where maybe you've left the house and you've gone on to college or you're living in an apartment by yourself or you're doing life, and all of a sudden you're in close quarters with another human being. And then being in close quarters with another human being brings out all of this weird stuff in you and you become convinced that it's the other person's fault. And you say, I just, this roommate is the worst roommate ever. This friend is the worst friend ever. Or you're a newly uh, wed person and you wake up one morning and you think this is the wrong person because this person brings out all of this bad stuff in me. Well, it may not be, first of all, it's not the wrong person, um, or if you'd like the way Hauerwas, the theologian, said it, uh, in some sense, everybody marries the wrong person, and so this is, this is a, you know, welcome to the necessary disillusionment of our romantic ideals, right? Uh, but, it, but that for another day. <laughs> there is a sense in which the, the next close relationship you have has a way of exposing the ways that you learned to do intimacy and the way that you learn to uh, attach or not attach to another person. In other words, we learn to love by the way that we were loved or not loved by our families. And so when you think about that, you think about how, what a massive uh, impact we have as parents and what a massive impact we have on one another and close relationships actually have a way of revealing our own dysfunctions. And so it's easy to project outwards and say it's that person's fault, but actually all it's doing is exposing the thing in you that you never learned or never got whole from or never got healed from. Now, I'm telling you all this because our text this morning is in 1 Samuel 20, and it's the story of Jonathan and David's close friendship, a covenant kind of friendship. And this whole series has been called Uh, is called Kingdom and Chaos. And we've called it that because of the question we've been asking ourselves as as we've gone through this Old Testament book of 1 Samuel is, how does God bring his kingdom on earth? And one of the answers to that question is, through the way that we love one another. How does God bring his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? Through the way that we love one another. Jesus would say this hundreds of years after 1 Samuel and and to say to his disciples, the world will know that you are my students, that you are my followers, that you are following in this way of the kingdom by your theology memorization skills, (laughs) by your love for one another. The way that, one of the primary ways that God's kingdom arrives on earth is through the way the followers of Jesus love one another. Now, when you think about Jonathan and the way that Jonathan and David cultivate this friendship and this love for one another, it's really pretty shocking that Jonathan knew how to do close relationships. Because look at his family of origin. I mean, what a mess. I mean, look at this, okay, so Saul, I just want to jump to verse 30 real quick, and then we're going to break down the chapter a little bit more, but verse 30, towards the end of the chapter, it says, then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman, we might have a different phrase today, (laughs) but Saul is saying this to his own son. What does that mean about what Saul thinks about his wife? I mean, hello, dysfunction alert. And then he says, don't you know that you've chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? And and he goes on and then he throws a spear to try to kill his own son. Now let me just pause for a moment and make a little side comment. Last week, Pastor Jason did a brilliant job of talking about the sin of envy and what happens when you have an evil eye and the way that you see the world and that evil eye seeds into, seeps into an evil heart and then a murderous hand. And let me just pause for a moment and just say, anytime you see jealousy, anger, hatred, murder, that is the work of the devil himself. And you see it in the scripture from Cain and Abel. And you see it in the scriptures when Jesus says, these are the works of the devil, to steal, to kill, and destroy. So wherever we see it in the world, whether it goes by the name of white supremacy, 
or whether it goes by the name of something else, anytime you see that evil eye and that murderous spirit, that is the work of the devil himself. It's the work of the devil. Come on, y'all. That's the work of the devil. You better get, get with me on this, okay? Now, listen. The reason we name it as such is because the kingdom of Jesus Christ moves in the opposite direction. We don't wrestle against, against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You better believe that when we see these headlines, Christians ought to be paying attention and to say, there is a demonic activity around the world stirring up the spirit of racial hatred and white supremacy, and those are lies from the pit of hell, and that is the work of the devil himself to steal and to kill and destroy, and the church of Jesus Christ stands and lives in opposition to that. And so here's Saul. Here's Saul descending into the depths of wickedness. The spirit of the Lord is lifted from him. An evil spirit has taken root in him. And we know the fruit of that. We know what that looks like. And then you think about Jonathan and you think, dude, how did you learn how to be a friend? How did you learn to live differently? Listen, some of you came from homes that can be characterized as being dysfunctional. Some of you came from marriages that have broken up because of a failure from the other person to love you well. And I wanna say to you this morning, this is a passage of hope because your family history is not your life's destiny. Your family history is not your life's destiny. And so Jonathan came from a messed up home, but Jonathan changed the story. Or rather we should say, God changed the story for Jonathan. And he learned how to love in a different kind of way. It's not too late. Wherever you find yourself today, it's not too late. And so I want us to look this morning at just what kind of love this is. The word that's used in a couple different verses, we heard it read this morning, and I just want to read a a couple of them to you. Verse 8, and then again in verse 14 and 15, the same Hebrew word is used there. In verse 8, it's it's translated this way, Therefore, deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. This is David talking. But if there is guilt in me, kill me yourself, for why should you bring me to your father? This is David talking. And then in verse 14 and 15, Jonathan replies, and he says, If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord, that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever, when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. The same word is used when David says, deal kindly, and when Jonathan says, show me the steadfast love. And it's the Hebrew word hesed. What is hesed? Now, just to tell you, (laughs) I first discovered this word hesed because my parents were Bible school students and then Bible school teachers, and they were so rocked by the power of this word hesed that when we got a puppy, they named the dog hesed. (laughs) So to me, hesed is about this big, he's brown, furry tail. (laughs) But the word, yeah. (laughs) The word has said is used 246 times in the Old Testament. 246 times. Most of the time, it's used in reference to God's covenantal love for his people. God's own covenantal, steadfast love. It's translated many different ways in English. Sometimes it's translated in your Bible as loyalty. Sometimes as faithfulness. Sometimes as kindness. Sometimes as love. Sometimes as mercy. A lot of times, hesed is invoked where one party is in a position to help, they're in a position of strength, but it might not necessarily be their obligation to help, or it might not even be expected of them to help, but has said surprisingly, often unconventionally says, I will use my place of strength for your good. I will use my position of strength for your good. And so the, the commitment here between Jonathan and David is mutual, even if it is not symmetrical. It's mutual even if it's not symmetrical. What I mean is David's on the run. Jonathan's in a place of strength. Yes, David's been anointed, but Saul doesn't really want to pay attention to that. So one person has a little bit more leverage, but the commitment is mutual to one another. That's what Hesed looks like. I want to say this morning three things that are the mark of steadfast love. 
The first is found in a couple different sections. We're going to jump all over this text. So actually, let's just follow on the screen if you can or in your Bibles. Verse 4 through 7, Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I will do for you. And David said to Jonathan, behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit at the table with the king. But let me go that I may hide myself in the field till the third day at the evening. Basically, there's a party that Saul is throwing. David's expected to attend because he's part of the king's court. But he says, I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be hiding. And this is going to be our little plan. Verse 6. If your father misses me at all, then say, oh, David earnestly asked leave of me to run to Bethlehem, his city, for there's a yearly sacrifice there for all of his family. And then verse 7, but if he says good, it will be well with your servant. Uh, If he says good, it will be well with your servant. But if he is angry, then know that harm is determined by him. So they make this plan. And then verse 12 and 13. Then Jonathan said to David, the Lord, the God of Israel, be a witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, behold, if he is well disposed toward David, shall not I then send and disclose it to you? But should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to me, to Jonathan and more also, if I do not disclose it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. And then verse 16 And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. The first thing I want to say about steadfast love is that steadfast love is concretely expressed. It's concretely concretely expressed. In other words, this is more than a sentiment. It may be emotional. In fact, the story feels emotional. When you read, there's tears toward the end. There's this funny little verse that says, and David and Jonathan, after the plan has worked, and Jonathan's come back to say, you got to get out of here. And David knows that Jonathan came through for him. It says that they both wept, but David more so. I don't know why we're told that, but you get the sense that this was an emotional kind of, of love for one another, and yet it's more than emotional. It's concretely expressed. You know, one of the great uh, mistakes that we make in our day is waiting until it's too late to tell another person what they mean to us. As a pastor, I get to uh, participate in in many memorial services, funerals, and, and over the years, the things that are said at these services are just so beautiful. And the, the, the best ones are the ones where you know that these people have been saying this all along to the person that's been alive. But I would love to suggest to you this morning that eulogies are for the living. Eulogies are best given to the living. To speak to the people while they're here and to say, this is what you mean to me. And this is what your friendship is to me. Jonathan and David, don't leave this unsaid. They say it to one another. They express it to one another. This is what I think of you. This is what our friendship means to one another. I know it's awkward sometimes. Friends don't like to speak about how much the friendship means. But maybe we can get over that. (laughs) And maybe we can say, look, it's important that you know what this friendship means to me. It's important that you know how uh, significant your encouragement is to me. And then not just words that express it, but actions that kind of back it up. When, when Holly and I were dating, and, and she was really the, the first person and only person I've ever dated, uh, I, I, when we were dating in college, I, um, I would write her these poems. You know, I'm not a great poet, but I would just, it just evoked poetry out of me. And, um, and it was great, you know, nice words. But I realized that once we got married and started having kids that it wasn't poetry she wanted, it was help in the kitchen, you know. <laughs> and so words are great. But eventually, words have to turn into actions that back it up. And so, steadfast love concretely expressed may look like diaper duty and like taking shifts and doing this and carpools, and it might look in different ways. And friends, it might look like showing up at someone's house to shovel a driveway in the midst of this after the snowstorm and the aftermath of the cyclone. Steadfast love is concretely expressed through words and Actions. And then as we go on in the story, go back to, verse, uh, to chapter 18, verse 1 and 3. 
As soon as he had heard, had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as much as his own soul. And then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. This is back in chapter 18. This is kind of our introduction into their friendship with one another. And then you get down here to verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 42, the end of the whole story. After the whole drama is over, Jonathan said to David, go in peace. Because we have sworn, both of us, in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. These three chapters, 18, 19, and 20, are told with the bookends of Jonathan and David's friendship. In other words, we don't get the story of Saul trying to kill David without the framing of that story by the strength of friendship love. See, Steadfast love is constant through the trial. Steadfast love is constant through the trial. We don't get uh, told about their love for one another and then the story goes on and then sort of the, the storyteller forgets about Jonathan and David. No, he says, listen, I want you to know that all of the difficulty that David's going through, that all of this, the sacrifice that Jonathan is going through, think of how he's losing his own uh, future of being king. This is the crown prince. And yet what we see is through that storm, through that trial, their love for one another remains strong. Uh, it's difficult for us in an age where we have so many options. And so one of the great lies in our age is, well, I'll just go find a different friend group. Well, I'll just go find a different church. Or I'll just go find a different spouse. I'll just find, I, I just, you know, let me just get back on match.com and let me just figure something else out. Maybe this was, a, you know. and dating, I, I understand that dating has changed and there's, I'm not saying anything negative about online dating. I'm only saying the caution to us about the temptation to think that when, some, when a relationship gets difficult to say, well, maybe there's dozens more out there. Instead of maybe considering that, hey, maybe this is the kind of fire that will strengthen our relationship. Maybe this, now, I'm not talking about abusive relationships. I'm not talking about harmful relationships. I'm not talking about toxic relationships. Those are necessary endings. But there are other times when your friendship or your marriage is tested. And one person's going through a difficult time. And so you say, ah. You know, one of the things we've discovered is sometimes what puts the most strain on a friendship is when one person is going through a really difficult time and the other person is not. And so you have one friend that life seems to be quote unquote working and the other person who just feels like the floodgates of difficulties opened up. And sometimes that puts a great strain on a friendship because we want there to feel like there's equilibrium. Like I'm there for you in the same way that you're there for me. But in this, in this case of Jonathan and David, it's David who's a refugee. It's David who's a fugitive, who's a hunted man, and it's Jonathan who's still the king's son, and his dad's ready to sort of say, just keep your seat at the table, literally. And sometimes that's one of the greatest things that puts a strain on our friendship when someone's going through a more difficult time than the other, but I'm telling you, if we could learn to be the kinds of friends that say, it's okay, it doesn't have to be even Stevens all the time. It doesn't have to be like equal where we're always helping one another out. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. It, it could also be that for this season, I'm there for you in a way that is more profound than you've been for me. And you know what? It requires humility on the part of the person who needs help, doesn't it? Because a lot of times, if you're in that desperate place, you feel like, oh, I don't want to ask for help again. I don't want to say again I need something but if you do, you do. And David opens up chapter 20 with this vulnerable thing of saying, what have I done? I, I, why is he trying to kill me? What's wrong with your dad? <laughs> you know? And, and Jonathan responds, hey, what do you need me to do? Whatever you say to do, I will do. That's what Jonathan says. And so it requires great humility on the part of the person who's going through a crisis to say, yeah, I need your help. I don't want to be that friend. I don't want to be that guy, but I, here I am again. Need your help. And it takes great patience on the part of the person in a place of strength to say, it's okay, I'm here. What do you need? Tell me what to do. I'll do it. Steadfast love is constant through the trial. 
as a church, we, we're committed to kind of helping different relationships work through difficulties. It's one of the reasons Sarah, Sarah Jackson runs the Emotionally Healthy Relationships course. A couple times here, I think you're running it right now, and it's packed, it's full, full sold out. We do it, it might sound basic, might seem simple, but it's amazing how the art of friendship and committed relationships, whether in a marriage or in a group of friends, requires a steadfastness to it through a time of trial, through difficulty. For marriage, marriages, Jim and Martha Cole lead a first year marriage group so that in that moment of that first year where you realize, oh, <laughs> Now, we never had that, but yeah, I've heard that people. <laughs> that in that moment where you can say, ah, how do we continue to be steadfast through this? That's one of the ways we do that. As the story goes on, the whole plot works out. Jonathan and David, they, they involve a boy to help, you know, kind of uh, spread the news, a little messenger. And so verse 24, we pick up the story. David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon came, the king sat down to eat the food, and the king sat in his seat as at other times on the seat by the wall. Jonathan sat opposite him, and Abner sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Yet Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought something has happened to him. He is not clean. Surely he's not clean. But on the second day, the day after the new moon, David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why has not the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? But Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go for our clan holds a sacrifice in the city and my brother has commanded me to be there. So now if I have found favor in your eyes, let me get away and see my brothers. He's quoting David. For this reason, he has not come to the king's table, Jonathan says. And then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, the phrase we've already read, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. This is Saul's way of saying, dude, do you get it? You're choosing to be loyal to David, but don't you know that your loyalty is going to cost you your throne? Your loyalty is going to cost you your destiny. Neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. This could have been an aha moment for Jonathan in the, in the negative sense. He could have said, oh, my gosh, yeah, that's right. Dad, totally, I'm in. Crown me. Let's go kill David, king me. He doesn't do that. And then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. And so Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. Now, pause right here. This is the exact scene or, or exact action that Saul had done with David. Thrown a spear at him. In a very literal sense, Jonathan is now sitting in David's place. Instead of David being there and having a spear aimed at him, now Jonathan is sitting there and having a spear aimed at him. Jonathan has taken David's place. And so he knows. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food on the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. The third and final thing we see about steadfast love is that steadfast love is costly to the end. Costly to the end. Jonathan doesn't bail when the going gets tough. He says, he stands up for his friend to the point where he's literally standing in his place. And of course, when you look at this, you realize that Jonathan's own steadfast love points forward towards Christ's steadfast and saving love. Jonathan's steadfast love points forward. I mean, think of this. Think of all the ways that this is a prefiguring of Jesus. Colossians says Jesus is the firstborn of creation. Jesus, the Son of God, the royal Son of God. And yet, as we heard last week, Philippians 2, yet Jesus himself empties himself. Didn't consider that status something to be grasped, but empties himself. Jesus, our New Testament reading said today from 2 Corinthians, became poor of no status so that we could become rich. Jesus took the spears actually in his side. It's Jesus' unwavering covenantal love for us that saves us in the end. That saves us in the end. Jesus is 
like the true and better Jonathan. That we read this story and we think, I know someone else like that. And maybe this is the story Jesus had in mind when in John's gospel he says, there's no greater love than that a man lay down his life for a friend. And he's maybe thinking, there's a great story of a man who almost laid down his life for a friend, who st- was willing to, who stood in that place. The thing that I want us to see this morning as we get ready to close and come to the table is that it's only the steadfast love of Christ that saves us and heals us so that we can show his steadfast love to others. Jonathan's commitment to David ultimately saves David's life. It saves him. And this is why I think David weeps even more than Jonathan at the end because he realizes you gave up everything for me. Could have been your throne, should have been your throne. You took, you dodged the spears. You gave it all. And you saved my life. Friends, there is only one perfectly steadfast love. It's the love of Christ. And all of us here, we've been hurt in different ways. Maybe you've been hurt by parents. Maybe you've been hurt by a spouse. Maybe you've been hurt by friends. Maybe you've been hurt by church leaders, and Christians. And you say, well, steadfast love. Never experienced that. But there is one love that is perfectly steadfast. Never wavered. Never flinches. Not for a moment. Not for a moment has God forgotten you. Not for a second. There's never been a fraction of a moment where God said, His love for you is constant. His love for you is concretely expressed on the cross. His love for you is costly all the way to the end. Not for a moment has Jesus ever failed to love you. And it's this kind of love that will ultimately not just save you, but heal you, put you back together again. And make it so your life can put this kind of love on display for others. I love what Jonathan says to David. He says, says, David, would you show me the steadfast love of God? Would you show me that? This is what we get to do. This is our calling as Christians. We get to show others the steadfast love of God. Look, it's not going to be perfect. We're going to be mirrors that are slightly cracked. Mirrors that are smudged and a little greasy. But the steadfast love of Christ is putting us back together again so that we can show others the same love. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Maybe just take a moment and Maybe just say to the Lord, I receive your love. I receive your love, God. Romans says that God has spread out, shed abroad in our hearts his love. It's the Holy Spirit that leads us to this deep, inside, unshakable knowledge of God's love for us. Maybe some of us just need to say that, God, I receive your love. Thank you for your love that never quits, that never fails, is faithful to the end. Steadfast, steadfast. Brian, can we just do that old chorus, the steadfast love? Can we just do that? Steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never comes to an end. They are new.
Let's sing that again one more time. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new. Thy faithfulness, oh.